Hey there, everyone. Welcome to our season finale of The Cloud is Calling. And I am absolutely excited to be joined by none other than Mr. Tony Olzak, who is our Trace3 CTO and one of the folks who helped bring me here to Trace3. So, Tony, it is great to have you on as the final guest for season one. Thank you so much for. Yeah, you got me. it. Thanks for having me, Derek. Appreciate absolutely. it. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, it's been a very interesting time in cloud. Uh, we've seen some, you know, layoffs happening. There are other various things going on. Um, and, and quite, I think, feel like the whole tech industry has kind of hit this speed bump or slight roadblock or anthill or whatever term you want to use for it. Um, but organizations are still looking to optimize and interact with their clients via the cloud. And so what industries do you think are key to seeing where technology is taking them? Yeah, Derek, that's a that's a great question. You know, first, I think just address the layoffs because I think it's it's part of this whole journey and, and where everything is going. And there were tens of thousands of people laid off in tech and you know, during the first quarter of the, this year. And what's interesting about that, I was reading the other day and I don't remember if it was the Wall Street Journal or, you know, some other um, some other news outlet like that, but it basically talked about how over 80% of those people had immediately found jobs, you know, somewhere else. And so it's interesting when we talk about the tech industry and we talk about layoffs because there's still so many job openings in special key areas, especially things like cloud security, cybersecurity, data, things that are really moving the needle that the job shortage still far outpaces the number of people who are losing their jobs. And so it's really just about, how those layoffs are rekeying strategy or overhiring that occurred in certain areas as, as the industry changes, which kind of gets us to into who is still adopting cloud and how it makes a difference as businesses rethink how they they feel about digital and and how it's making a true business impact. Business impact, I think, being the key word because as we think about who's investing in cloud and what industries, and you're still seeing you know healthcare invest very heavily in cloud, uh, financial services manufacturing, et cetera. You have all these different industries who are still looking to create advantage and it has everything to do with, um, you know, where cloud is going as an industry, which is to provide, are you getting true business value from your cloud? I, I used to ask people all the time, you know, are you truly getting business value from cloud or are you just in someone else's data center? And I think as people reflect on that question and what the answer of their own experience is, they realize that they've got this, this next frontier in front of them which is how you know, industry related components can really accelerate the change that a business can go through because it's more, much more highly tailored towards them getting results immediately and things that really matter to the business. Yeah, no, I, I, I certainly share those sentiments and I know of, as I've seen colleagues and friends and others, right. Um, comment on some of the layoffs, you know, in various in industries, and other folks from tech who are like, yeah, unfortunately, right. Um, it's like three days later, they're like, okay, I'm now, you know, at this place. So to your point, yeah, I feel like even though tech industry has kind of optimized itself from all the various positions and other things, right. They, that tech, that talent, that skilling has now dispersed into other areas. And so I think hopefully over as the next six to 12 months goes, we'll see some really cool things come out of the different areas that you talked about, right? Healthcare, life sciences, manufacturing, uh, financial services, and others, right? As they now have absorbed this talent from folks like Microsoft and Google and Amazon and others to advance that transformation and how they leverage those people's skill sets to get that competitive edge. You brought up a key point that I want to focus in on. Are there any new technologies that those industries should be keying into inside of the cloud platform as they look to transform and, and optimize their cloud environments? You know, I, I think that industry clouds, which is just like a general bucket term that all the hyperscalers are using, have really introduced some prepackaged composable modules that you can bring forth and consume inside your cloud environment and just get business benefits more quickly. And when people talk about this stuff, there's, I think there's a little bit of confusion of like what an industry cloud means and, and uh, how you can leverage it in the simplest format. And then I'll, I'll give you know some basic examples. There are 
versions of services that have been created, whether by third party or by the hyperscalers themselves, that are published services that you can consume that accomplish something that your segment of the industry, like your industry vertical and your segment needs to make a difference. And it could be as simple as if you were to think about like the retail side of the equation, uh, you can hire a ton of data scientists and go try to build a lot of stuff yourself to go figure out customer sentiments, supply chain management, um, personalized experience, all those kinds of things. Or you know, like Microsoft, for example, inside their retail industry cloud, they've got solutions for all those things that are already pre-built. And so part of you know getting back to that comment we made earlier around, are you just in someone else's data center? Are you getting true business value? Think about how quickly you could consume those services and get maybe 80% of the way there and begin tailoring from that point versus trying to go through that inc incredible journey to just go think about cloud as infrastructure and then go build those capabilities. And these are prime examples and across mo there's new industries that are popping up this year that were, you know, weren't around last year, the degree of maturity that's coming around and like the number of offerings that are coming out. It's pretty incredible. The things that you could do right out of the gate. So if you're a, a digital leader, a business leader somewhere, and you're looking at your roadmap and you're looking at what the art of the possible is for your business, there's some pretty incredible capabilities out there in industry clouds that you can consume immediately and just go get over that next milestone very quickly as you're accelerating your roadmap for change. It's funny that you talk about that because I actually remember if we hearken back to when I was interviewing with you and you had asked me to do a presentation uh, and I chose Microsoft Sentinel as my presentation. And one of the things I brought up was the ML model, right? And how as Sentinel progressed, you would eventually get to an advanced stage where you would consume pre-built ML models and then you would just modify that, right? That 80%. So they got you 80% of the way there and then you would just tweak that last little bit to your specific business, to your specific needs and then start generating threat hunting and advanced queries into your security data from that particular standpoint. And we, what was that, two years ago? That two we years ago, there? yeah. So, yeah, it's, yeah. it's funny to see it now transition not out of security into general needs across various sectors of, of our business. Well, I think you, you, you keyed in on a really important point there, which all those things that we just talked about are all related to data. Yeah. And, you know, the security, point that you were trying to make is all related to data. Almost all the industry cloud services that you can consume that are composable and you know modules that you may want to use to accelerate your business, they're all centered on data. And so there's been a lot of mystery around how you leverage data and what you have at your disposal in order to achieve better outcomes for whatever part of the business that you happen to be in. I mean, they're all data related and there's it's no accident and why this next evolution of cloud is occurring is because you know data is, is pushing the boundaries of everything we want to you know, and we won't get into all the things that I know you're excited about <laughs> happening in that space around you know the future of AI and that kind of stuff which we're all excited about yeah. but it's a very data heavy related discussion and the the beauty of things you know prepackaged solutions that get you most of the way there leveraging your data is that when we talk to a, a lot of leaders that are out there, everyone knows they should be using their data to do something. They also know that they're not doing it today. They, they're they always looking for ideas of how we should be leveraging their data. And so even just going through what an industry cloud can provide for you gives you a lot of core ideas of things that you should be thinking about if you're not already and things that can help you get there very quickly. And so it's, it's really interesting how data has come full circle on this as well. Yeah, no. And what, I think it was back in 2006, there was an article um, and I don't, I forget who wrote it, but they basically said data is the new oil, um, from that perspective, right? It is literally the most valuable thing in our world today. Um, yeah. and, I, and I, 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 I wholeheartedly agreed with it 20 some odd years or close to 20 years ago. And <laughs> I, I, you're getting old, Derek. <laughs> I know I'm showing my age there, um, <laughs> but we're, to that you know, point, you know, th there's interesting discussions around that too, of you know, if data is so valuable, is it on your balance sheet? Like, how are you considering it as an asset? Yep. And, mm -hmm. you know, to your company, I mean, there's, 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 we could go on a, you know, we could we, our tirade on that. We could, we'll skip that. But I do want to ask you a very interesting question. <laughs> yeah. Centered around data and maybe leading ed technology. Um, 
are, are you buying the the metaverse, right? Mm. You know, <clears throat> I have kids. Yep. And it, it's interesting watching. I try not to ever look at technology through the lens of, you know, purely through a business lens or purely through, you know, 40 plus year old person, you know, <laughs> however I may view the world. Because it's always interesting how kids adopt technology and then watching how that in the consumer world changes our expectations. And then ultimately, as those generations come up, it changes the, what we demand off of every interaction that we have in our life. And what's interesting about the metaverse is that I do believe that there's a lot of there's a lot of cool things happening in VR related things. I mean, my kids can do stuff in there that used to make me nauseous. And, you know, I know a lot of adults hop on there and like, I, I feel like I was going to, you know, I was going to vomit somewhere because <laughs> the emotion sickness. And when you first start thinking about that stuff, you're like, the metaverse could never succeed. And, you know, remote meetings like this, people would think that, oh, like the next generation is to do it in VR. And you would think at that time that that would never succeed because, anyone who's ever tried to wear one of those things for extended periods of time and like are sweating inside it and, and all this kind of stuff, there's no way we're going to spend the majority of our time interacting inside that kind of environment. But then you look at like my, my son, if he, you know, had his way would spend probably like a good four to eight hours a day inside VR related, you know, kinds of ac activities. And he has no, he thrives in it. He loves it. He's making new friends in, you know, doing those kinds of things. And, when you watch people begin to adapt and begin to embrace those kinds of things, like you, you do see the promise. I feel like metaverse itself is um, some pretty aspirational future state of what they would like to see. I, I think that the, the vision probably makes sense. They're going to have a really tough road because it's, this is all in the beginning and trying to get adoption and get people interested. I, I was just reading the other day about how property values in the metaverse are plummeting. Yep. You know, and and I think that you're going to see these interesting waves of, you know, what people actually want to do with their virtual reality type of environments, what the world can become. I think we're just so far off. It's so early stage right now that we're going to see a lot of ups and downs. And right now we're in the middle of a down. I think there's a lot of doubt. There's a lot of interesting pivots that are ha going to have to occur of what can this thing truly become the comfort level of, you know, the devices and things that you need to wear to become immersive, mm -hmm. but, you know, still have a great time. Um, but the fun factor is still there. Like the difference factor is still there. And if you can make it easy and consumable in ways, which is, you know, still far, far ways off, all technology to really truly take off has to feel transparent and almost like magic when it occurs. And there's still like a big step that needs to occur for the metaverse and all related things to, to, to happen. But you still see some interesting like upside and examples. Yeah. I was uh, at a K1 racing uh, venue in Irvine, California. Apparently, it's the only location in the country that has the full immersive VR uh, Mario Kart um, experience. And so I all took right. my kids karting, and then we all hopped on the, the, the Mario Kart VR experience. And it took a, a good 20 minutes to get set up, which was not fun. No. <laughs> but mm -hmm. once you were in there... It was the best Mario Kart experience that any of them ever had. And, oh, nice. and like the degree of feedback and the immersive experience that you were getting. I mean, you could you could completely see that how new content, new titles, new ways of thinking about VR interactions. A lot of that stuff is coming. It's going to be just a matter of time. The younger generation loves it, is spending much more time doing it. And I think you are going to see a change over time. It's just too soon for right now. Yeah, I think my best example, right, if I'm showing this correctly, is wearable technology. Um, and I'm talking about our kids. Um, my daughter has been into Power Rangers lately. And I remember as a kid in the early nineties, watching the original iteration of it. And they had their little communicators yeah. on their thing. And thinking back then, oh, there's no way we'll ever get to that. Here we are. Right. And, and that's, that was us, my generation staring at that and being like, Oh, that's cool. Like, I want that. And <laughs> and we've built it. We have it. So, yeah, I think to your point, right, We I think we're early on, but I think we'll get there. And I think there's so many things that we see from, you know, different areas of social culture, right, movies, um, technology, you know, other things that it's like, hey, if I can replicate what they do uh, with special effects with reality tech, 
right? Um, how cool, you know, how well would that transform how we treat patients in healthcare? How would we treat, you know, you know, mental health, other various things, right? With all of this different kind of augmented reality situations from a technology perspective. So, oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, I think the greatest thing about entertainment is you're not limited by what technology can actually do today. And so being able to express your imagination. And this is why sometimes I'll talk about democratizing innovation and how thinking that technologists are re solely responsible for innovation is, you know, very faulty thinking because anyone with an imagination can imagine what a, what the art of the possible could be if you had no shackles, no grounding in what it can actually do today. And movies and entertainment are, are you know, TV shows are a great place, comic books, all those kinds of things, because oh, yeah. anything that anyone can dream up is possible. I mean, Trace three, we all, you know, we always say we believe all possibilities live in technology. I, I live and die, but I truly believe that. And it's just a matter of time before all the things that you could possibly think that could come true with technology can happen. It's, it's yeah. really exciting to just live, live through it and watch it happen. No, completely agree. Uh, coming back to earth, I guess, in a tiny <laughs> bit, um, <laughs> over this, I think first quarter, uh, and, and macroeconomic environments, I think we thought, uh, certain trends would hold still. Um, and, and I'm not saying some have it around security and data security and other things, but I think one trend that surprised us, at least that I've seen, and, and I'd love your thoughts on this, has been this push of reliability. And I think out of nowhere, coming out of Q4 of 2022, coming into the first quarter of this year, um, there's this renewed focus on reliability, resiliency, um, not just disaster recovery, but being able, I guess, figuratively to take kind of a, a jab or a body blow from a, a product perspective and still continue to service your customers, your, your employees, your end users, and them not being any of the wiser that there may be an outage or a ransomware attack or a denial of service, something of that nature. Uh, why, why is that? Why has resiliency all of a sudden become this huge focal point? at this point you know when you think about topics like resiliency it sometimes it, it would be shocking to people that it ever goes away because you would just think from a technology standpoint that people are constantly thinking about this and this is top of mind then you just get into the politics of a business and you know what happens with budgets what happens with aging technology and you know the amount of time money and effort it takes to refresh those kinds of things and then things kind of fall by the wayside and inevitably the way that we consume technology and, and patterns change and then you're exposed to resiliency kinds of things that you never really saw before that change the way you think about it i think the reason why it's become such a huge topic right now is, is we just have had very public big interruptions in service that weren't just things that everyone knew about but then affected thousands if not you know, millions. a million millions of people. <laughs> and especially on the consumer side, you know, when, um, you know, we had, you know, Southwest outages, we had, you know, we had uh, all flights getting grounded. I yeah, actually was they, traveling yep. at that time and mm -hmm. um, we ended up road tripping across halfway across Texas because all flights were grounded that day in uh, just across the, the entire country. You ground all flights in the United States for a day. And that's a pretty huge eye opening moment. And what's interesting is I bet I would bet anything that if you talk to the technology teams responsible for those systems that caused the outage, they would have told you they've been asking to modernize for the last 10 years and were never given the budget, the time, the people, the resources, anything. And, and everyone just got pushed it back, you know, to the back of the stack. Yeah. And it wasn't because no one knew. It's just because it just wasn't a priority. So it's really interesting. Like we we always have things that happen every year. Cybersecurity is notorious for this, where every time you begin to sleep on cybersecurity, some massive event happens, it wakens everyone, it becomes public. And then at the board level, there are questions around what about our own organization? And you know, are we exposed? Do we have the same kind of risk that's sitting out there? Whether it's cybersecurity related or it's you know other technology, you know, items that are related to you know building and resiliency. And um, so now it's a big topic again because the yep. whole world was affected. And now it's a board level discussion and it just takes a question, 
you know, do we have any systems or any capabilities or any critical um, digital assets that could be impacted in the same kind of fashion? That mad scramble begins and then the entire industry is talking about resiliency and all of a sudden there's tons of consulting around it. And um, those are things that you would hope built into best practice along the way as we think about just architecting new solutions, product management, the capabilities that you have, that this is an ongoing process. But every year that shows us that, you know, there are things that fall by the wayside and we need, should be taking a very intentional approach of what risk you're incurring and that everyone has agreed that that's going to happen. I don't think everyone always gets read in on what risk we agree to take on due to budgetary constraints. And that should be a very open process. And I, yeah. I feel like the, the more you involve people in the, the choosing that needs to occur, we don't have unlimited budgets. We don't have unlimited assets and unlimited people. So it's understandable that some things are going to incur risk. I just don't know that it's always transparent to everyone in the organization who should be a part of that discussion. And everyone, once it gets past one year, that it doesn't get forgotten about, you know, sitting in an old dusty closet that, oh, yeah, we talked about that 10 years ago and we've never brought it up since because it never was greenlit. And I, I think that's that's a lot of stuff that you see. I mean, you and I have been in, you know, consulting of some type for a very long time. And every time something happens, I think people in the, in the, you know, everyday world are shocked at, at things that occur. And then when you're on the consulting side, you say, these are things we're talking about every single day. And it should not surprise you that there are systems, critical capabilities sitting out there that from a cybersecurity perspective and from like an overall resiliency perspective have major gaps that no one has done anything about. And it's not because people are, you know, don't have the best intentions. We've just allowed all this debt to accrue, like not just technical debt, but risk debt. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, I, I it always amazes me when we talk to people about, OK, yeah, you should really think about these things. And they're like, well, like that's kind of that priority. But all these things are, you know, that's I don't have budget for that or that's this. And I've got to deprioritize. And then, um, yeah, it it becomes this hope that doesn't surface or they don't get exposed or, you know, they're, I don't, I don't know, secretly hoping that it'll pop back up mystically. I think the following year or something like that. Yeah. And it's, it takes big public events. And then, you know, the questions always ask, well, you know, to your point, right. Why didn't we do something about it? And it's like, well, we tried to, and we, we got shot down or we yeah. didn't get greenlit. And, you know, we tried to warn you that this was the potential risk, but, you know, I think even, you know, an outage so massive like that, where you ground all planes, I think even a, a rational person would sit there and be like, not the likelihood of that happening should be like winning the lottery. And, but it did, like it did happen now. So, you know, what's, what's the follow up there from a risk perspective. And I, I think it's interesting to see now that I'm hoping that the level of focus sustains itself. Um, well, I, I think the there's, there's an interesting change that needs to, to happen in how we think about risk because people always talk about the chances of something happening, but you really should be focused much more on the ramifications of it happening because at some point it is going to happen. And there was a really great article that was written a long time ago. I can't remember who wrote it, but it was something to the effect of um, rock climbing uh, as an example. And mm -hmm. There was a, you know, a very famous climb and there was a world-class climber who was approaching it. I'm going to skip over all the details because uh, there's a part of this that really matters and some of the other stuff does, you know, don't. And the basics are, this is the first 50% of the climb or so was very easy. Mm -hmm. And so um, he took no precautions because he's world-class and he wanted to save all his energy and time for the highly technical second half of this climb and never made it there because one false move and plummeted to his death and you know to a world-class climber chances of him missing you know something in that first half of the climb and maybe like one percent you know maybe less you know just this this you know is unimaginable yeah the issue is that the ramification of it happening meant it's death. significant yeah significant which means that that should be accounted for and like while you think it's a very low chance of it happening you know there's always a chance. There's always a chance. And, and it's always interesting how people think about risk and how people calculate risk. And, you know, 
cybersecurity industry is a big one on this and, and you know, how they, they calculate it, but almost in every industry, there's countless books out there of, you know, how do you untangle, how you think about risk the best way. The only thing that's, that's great about today, I think is that we've got a lot of different ways to look at things, but what's even better than that is when you think about things like resiliency is that it was really difficult to build in the degree of resiliency that people could imagine, you know, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, it is extra extraordinarily easy in today's world with the cloud and, you know, services that are already baked out there for you to get most of the way there very, very quickly. And so as you are analyzing these things, the good news is, is that you can accelerate that change very quickly, thanks to where we are today. And, you know, hopefully this is uh, a good reminder to everyone of, you know, things that should be you know taken seriously into account and look into the ramifications. There's always a chance of what can occur, but if all flights are going to get grounded for the day, then, you know, maybe we should take a closer look at what's going to happen. <laughs> maybe we should. And then on that note, I think that's a great place to, to wrap up this. Uh, Tony, it was great catching up with you. Um, thank you so much for joining. I'm a great way to wrap up season one for us. Um, Definitely, definitely stay tuned for what we've got coming uh, next season. There will be a season two of The Cloud is Calling. Got a lot of great guests lined up, so make sure you stay tuned for that. Um, but for now, folks, just remember that The Cloud is Calling. <laughs>